So next we're going to hand over to Tom, and Tom is the technical architect for Credo. He's from the Hartley Foundation, which is part of the Science and Technology Facilities Council. So over to you, Tom. Thanks a lot, Simon, and hi, everyone. So as I said, my name is Tom Collingwood. I'm the Credo technical architect, which means I get the joy of following on from the excellent film and app with the least glamorous part of the webinar, but uh, we're just keeping it to a few slides. So what is Credo uh, at, a, at a technical level? Really, this is the first step along a much bigger journey. So we, the film and the demo of the app show you where we want to get to. It's my job to coordinate the technical side of our next few steps on that journey. To get started, we've narrowed down our scope to something small enough to deliver upon, and then we're going to iteratively improve on that. So we're focusing on this single use case to prove out the concept, but everything we're doing, we're intending to be foundational and we're expanding upon that in future iterations. And I think it's worth saying that we're not looking to replace network resilience planners. We're building a tool to help inform and supplement their decision-making process. And we're hoping that giving them that sight of the other network assets and, and the connections and interdependencies helps them to make more joined up resilience plans across industries. So this very much isn't about removing people from, from uh, these industries. It's, it's about giving them better information to, to do their jobs more effectively. It's really easy to focus on the visualization side of this, um, and that's the bit that sells most. Um, but really, 90% of the work we're doing is in the back end. So we're talking about data interoperability, plumbing, modeling, all of the stuff that you can see on the right hand side of, of the slide, really. It's a very high level schematic that roughly outlines what we're doing. So at a, at a at uh, high level, we're taking climate projection data, which looks at what, what the climate could be like in the future. We're mapping that through, through flooding models to, to flood conditions and flood scenarios. And we're gonna put that up against data from the asset owners, which we have to extract and transform. Um, and so we figure out what, we know where the assets are, we know what they look like, can we work out if they've flooded or not? Once we know if they've flooded, we can calculate the impact within their individual networks. And that's giving us the sort of information that you could have got to as an individual um, asset owner already, I guess. But it is that, that final step where we join them all together and we show the impact across the networks where we see the value there. Because it may be that even though your own assets haven't flooded, some of the assets that supply power or communication or cooling water to your own asset might have gone down in a flood. <clears throat> so where you thought you were safe, turns out you might not actually. So that's the what, but what about the, the when? So we're actively working on this stuff right now. Uh, by right now, I mean technical work is ongoing and we have our prototype system development underway. Uh, we aim to finish that by the end of December this year. We've then got some additional technical work in January, which will be ramping down at that point. Um, and we're working through into wrap up and dissemination in February and March next year. Um, and the, the whole thing will be, be wrapped up for, for the end of the financial year. By we, and Sarah's already touched on this, but um, just I'd echo those thanks. So we're really lucky to have three really engaged and very patient asset owners who are devoting technical staff time to helping us to develop that meaningful first output and make this useful. Uh, Mark McDonald as well have been really generous in bringing um, domain expertise into the technical work. And as Sarah mentioned, we've got the information management framework. So Borough Solutions and Telecent are the, the work will be covered at a later webinar on the IMF, but um, in short, it's what makes it easy for us to connect up more systems and for this to scale in future. It's about enabling that data interoperability and also enabling sort of permissioned data sharing across organizations, which is, is a key element and a key enabler in, in making a, a connected digital twin work at a national scale. The next two levels above that on the diagram, effectively, we have a kind of platform and infrastructure level. So CMCL are providing the dynamic knowledge graph that sits underneath everything that we do. So that represents all of the assets and everything that's happening to them. As I said, the Hartree Center where I work is, is providing um, not only myself as a technical architect, but also research software engineers and data scientists to support the other work streams. Uh, Daphne, the, the data and analytics facility for national infrastructure platform is where we're it's our secure environment where we're hosting all the information and doing all the model development and model serving at the end. And the connected places Catapult have um, got, a, in addition to bringing CMCL in, are also putting data science effort into this. And then the universities and the Met Office across the top are doing some of the interesting modeling work directly. So the University of Edinburgh is looking at that uh, system of systems modeling and how you bring full systems, well, how they fall over and how you bring them back up. Exeter and the Met Office jointly have the, the Joint Center of Excellence in Environmental Intelligence. So that's where we're getting our flood information and everything to do with the, the climate projection data. 
and Warwick and Newcastle are collectively doing some expert elicitation work, which we'll come on to in a second. It's a really big team across a massive number of organizations, and most of us have never met in person. Um, but despite that, we've already come quite a long way together in this project. Um, so a couple of slides, thank you. Uh, this is a, it's been a collaborative journey. We've encountered some, some challenges on the way, some of which we expected. Um, some of them have been quite novel. So the first one was, was scope. So we had a bunch of talented people in different organizations and we had to really draw the line somewhere to make this deliverable in, a, in the sort of project timeframes. So initially just figuring out where to draw the line was something we had to do a lot of work with. Secondly, uh, legal agreements. So that, that comment about it being six to 12 months to get data sharing agreements in the film, it's, it's not a throwaway comment. That, that is real and that, and that happened. So it took a long time for us to get the information collected on the data on the asset owner side, but also shared with us and, and in, a, in a way that everyone was comfortable with. Uh, Participation is next, so uh, there's, there's a socio-technical element to this project, and we're building tools to facilitate data sharing and connectivity, but the best tools in the world aren't enough without people to get involved and to, to help us drive what they look like and also to help use them as well, so we, we ensure that what we're doing is effective. Now, digital twin development often includes validation of some sort against existing data. So you, you build the model of the system, you test it out in cyberspace, you test it out in the real world, and you, and you check that the two align. So you know that your digital twin is roughly aligned. Now, we can't, we can't simulate a flood in 2050 and then throw some real data at it to check it because we don't have any floods from 2050 to check yet. So we're having to work with um, a couple of different validation strategies there, but one of which is expert validation. So we're getting domain experts from Mott McDonald to help with making sure our outputs from flood modeling seem sensible. And the second strategy we have is around uncertainty quantification. So we're not just looking at giving an exact measure of the flood will be here. We're giving a rough estimate, some confidence around that to say the flood is probably going to be here and it's going to be somewhere between this size and that size. And this is the, a quantification of how much we don't know in the assumptions that have been made in the way into um, to giving you those numbers. So we're not giving hard and fast figures that would be misleading. It has to be a little bit more subtle than that. Now, the data wasn't all sat ready to go waiting on the asset owner side of it. It often sits in multiple systems with different schema and it needed extracting and manually joining together to begin with. Some of that data wasn't in systems and was in reports and needed to be extracted as well. And some of it wasn't even in a written form at all. Some of this is expert knowledge that sits in people's heads. And that's where, as I mentioned earlier, Warwick and Newcastle are, are leading this work um, in expert elicitation. So this is a kind of structured interviewing process to get information out of the technical experts, both of the asset owners and with the, the domain experts at Mark McDonald's. Um, so we can turn what exists in experts' heads into probabilistic models that we can then fit into our computational workflow. It's a really interesting area of work, and I think it's something that can add a lot of value where you don't necessarily have all the data written down in a system, but you can still get something quite meaningful out of it. It's, it's quite a novel approach to this. Sarah mentioned security, and we are working with national infrastructure data here. So we've, we've been very careful on that. And obviously I won't go into specifics, but we have a secure cluster where everything is uh, hosted and all of our development work is being done. And we've it took quite a bit of time to get there, but that, that's some learnings that we've got and we can share those as well after the project. Um, and the final one that's it's a really emergent one for us at the moment is looking at future plans. So we've got a lot of information about what the network looks like today, but when you're looking at what might be happening in a few decades time, what's the network going to look like then? And how do you make your future plans for what your network is going to look like fit with the data that tells you what your current network is so you can build models and, and ensure that you're working on information that, that is useful for the time period that we're looking at. So we've come a long way through all of this, um, but the value doesn't stop there. Uh, we've got one eye on the bigger picture the whole time we're doing this. So uh, some of the stuff that is really valuable today already is stuff like data visibility. So the asset owners have said to us that actually they haven't seen their data looking like this in the past. You know, they can see their own view, but, but being able to see how their data and their, their assets look in relation to everyone else's, that's novel in itself. And that adds value before we even get to the modeling side. We also had a bit of a light bulb moment where um, we were talking to the asset owners about how everything runs within the industry. Um, and they were talking about the service level agreements that they have to sign up to with their individual regulators. Now, once you start looking at this as a mesh, as an interconnected net set of networks, 
having each of them individually talking to individual regulators who set targets on how everything works feels a little bit like it's not quite joined up anymore. Um, so starting to play into the conversation around how we look at the full system of systems view and what that might mean for regulators as well as for the operators. I've talked about expert elicitation, and I think that's already of some value in the project, but the more conversations we have, the more data that we're, we're going to derive from that. And that's a really big part of um, getting more value both now and in future. We'll also be releasing some information about the methodology and our findings so other people can use that in future. And we're also synthesizing data and releasing our code. So it's, we can't release the asset owner data, but we want to be able to make our outputs available to people. So to do that, we'll create synthetic data so you can take what we've developed and you can run it on a representative data set. And that'll help people to get up to speed with where we are, start seeing how our systems work and look at building that up and, and enabling uptake and scale out on, across different industries and, and different applications as well. But finally, when we talk about value, we're not really talking about a financial measure here. I think we spend a lot of time talking about assets and networks, which is, they're incredibly clinical terms. Um, but I like the film for bringing this back to what we're really talking about, which is keeping homes and schools and hospitals online. We're talking about people, uh, and that's what matters at the end of the day. So in summary, uh, we're working on this right now and we're excited about it. Uh, we've got a lot to do in a short space of time, but we're building everything with one eye on future extensibility. We'll be releasing our work alongside a synthetic data set so other people can join us soon on the technical journey. And some of the lessons we've learned so far have nothing to do with technology, um, but we'll try and share those as best we can as well. So that's everything from me. Uh, thank you, Simon.